Today's scripture comes from Genesis, it's chapter 45, 1 through 15. If you have a Bible, feel free to re, uh, follow along with us. If you do not have a Bible, we have Bibles right by the doors. You can grab one now or on your way out. So again, it's Genesis 45, 1 through 15. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept out loud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for, for you sold me here. But God sent me before you to preserve life for the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing or harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for many survivors. So it's not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Nancy. Well, good morning, uh, Christ community. Good to see you all. Uh, my name is Reed Kappel. I serve as the campus pastor here. Uh, it's a joy to be with you as we turn to God's word this morning. But I want to pray for our time uh, as we jump into uh, this narrative of the life of Joseph in Genesis. So let's take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your Son and by the power of your Spirit. Lord, asking that you would teach us what we do not know, show us what we do not see, and make us who we are not so that we might enjoy and find the purpose of why you have called us, why you have created us. And so, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you in this time. Would you remove all barriers that keep us from knowing you and seeing you? Show us your truth that we might walk in your ways. We pray this, Lord, all in the name of Christ Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Well, I love, um, I love good uh, payback stories, like stories of revenge and, and people kind of finally getting what they deserve, you know? There's just, there's just something about someone who just finally gets what they deserve that just makes me feel good. I don't know if that's bad or not, but it just makes me feel good. And, and there was a story recently, it was a local story that made national news. It was the story of Danielle Reno. Uh, her car was stolen with her purse and phone inside of it. And, and she notified the authorities, but if, if you heard the story, she also took matters into her own hands. She contacted her credit card company to find out if the thieves were using her card, and lo and behold, they were. And she tracked down, she went to a gas station where they had just uh, uh, visited, and she spoke to the manager there. Uh, The manager let Danielle view the surveillance footage, and so they were able to identify who the thieves were. The, the manager of the gas station also remembers hearing the thieves talk about their plans to dine at Applebee's later that night, okay? So not only are they morally corrupt, they have bad taste in restaurants. And so, <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, kind of. So, so uh, now, Danielle and her friends, they decide they divvy up because there's three uh, Applebee's kind of in the general area. So they divide up, and they're waiting, and lo and behold, the thieves walk into the restaurant that Danielle is waiting in. And she's kind of freaking out. She gets up, she walks outside, and with her spare key, steals her car back. <laughs> notifies the authorities who arrive and arrest them on the spot. Which is just, that, yes, that's clappable. That is clappable. 
I am convinced, Daniel Reno is Batman. I am convinced of it. I am convinced of it. It's just, I mean, it's a remarkable story. And, and I think we're all drawn into these stories. I mean, even like, just think about it. You were, I had you on the edge of your seat. There's something about payback stories that just feel so good. And I think it's because payback feels so natural. We're so hardwired for it. And even so, the, the great uh, uh, playwright, you know, Bill Shakespeare, in his great uh, play, the, the Merchant of Venice, uh, he pens these famous words for us. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? There's something about payback and revenge that just feels so natural, so hardwired to who we are. And I think payback feels so natural precisely because... It's opposite, I think forgiveness feels so unnatural. Payback feels so natural for us because I believe forgiveness feels so unnatural. And think about it, I mean, you don't have to teach a child to retaliate. You do have to teach a child to forgive, or a grown man for that matter, okay? You have to teach forgiveness, you don't teach payback. And I believe this is the the center of this story that we see in the life of Joseph. We, we've been journeying through Genesis, and we come to this last major narrative in the book of Genesis centered around the person of Joseph. And what I hope we come to find through his story and his life is this very interesting point I believe is true, is that forgiveness feels foolish. If we're honest, forgiveness feels foolish, but it is always the right choice. Forgiveness feels foolish, but it is always the right choice. Now, We have a lot of text to cover, so I want to kind of jump in and set the stage here for us. So the end of Genesis 41, if you were with us last week, Joseph is brought out of prison, and because of his gift of interpreting dreams, he's brought to Pharaoh. Pharaoh uh, loves Joseph. Pharaoh finds favor in the eyes of, uh, Joseph finds favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. That's a hard sentence to say. And and he puts, puts Joseph in a position of leadership over all of Egypt, where he is second only to Pharaoh. And so now Joseph is finally in a position of leadership, authority, privilege in his position. And then we get to chapter 42 and we find that the famine that was mentioned in one of the dreams of Pharaoh has come to fruition. So the famine has plagued Egypt and the surrounding nations. People are flocking in from various places to to buy grain and food from Egypt that Joseph has wisely stored up. And it just so happens that one of the group of travelers that has entered Egypt in search of food is none other than Joseph's brothers, the brothers who threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And in Genesis 42, verses 7 and 8, we see the reuniting of Joseph and his brothers. Starting in verse 7, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. And then down in verse 8, but they did not recognize him. So, I mean, how perfect is this? Like, Joseph finally is in a position of power and authority. At the snap of his fingers, he can put his brothers to death if he so desired. And they don't even recognize him. And it appears as though that Joseph is going down this path of kind of seeking revenge and payback. As the story unfolds, we find that that Joseph accuses his brothers of being spies. He then holds his brother Simeon hostage and tells the other brothers, go back and bring your brother Benjamin with you. And they do that. They bring Benjamin back. And upon their return, Joseph immediately frames Benjamin for a crime he didn't commit and threatens to put Benjamin to death. And so all of this is kind of leading towards what what feels like is going to be the greatest payback story in human history. And yet we see a very interesting turn. Now, if you're familiar with the story, if you know how the story ends, I just want you to to momentarily forget that. Forget how the story ends. And some of you, maybe this is the first time you've heard the story. And so I want you to just try to put yourself in the sandals, so to speak, of Joseph and ask yourself, what would you do in this moment? You have been betrayed by your brothers, rejected, left for dead, sold into slavery. You've experienced injustice after injustice. 22 years of all this emotion building up, you're finally reunited with them, and you have the ability to put your brothers to death. What do you do? And I want us to consider this as we think about what Joseph is kind of tempted with in this moment. And I want us to think about our own lives when we find ourselves in similar situations. I want us to ask this question of Joseph and ourselves, what happens when we don't forgive? What happens when we don't forgive? And some of you this morning may find yourselves at a crossroads where you, I mean, this is a very real and relevant case for you. This isn't just theoretical. This isn't just theology. This is real life. 
You are in a position where you have the ability to forgive or not forgive someone who has wronged you, rejected you, hurt you, maligned you, abused you in some way. But here's the thing I want us to understand about the irony of withholding forgiveness. What happens when we don't forgive? Well, in our attempts to hurt someone, to hurt the person who has hurt us, to seek payback and revenge, by withholding forgiveness, we think that we are bringing harm upon the wrongdoer, but in the end, we find we are actually bringing harm upon ourselves. Because you see, unforgiveness, what it does to us, it's not just a, a pain that we inflict upon the person who has wronged us. Unforgiveness, in our attempt to hurt someone by withholding forgiveness, it ends up becoming a self-inflicted wound because unforgiveness becomes this, this, this kind of poison that ferments in our hearts that turns into the sour wine of bitterness and resentment and self-righteousness that begins to corrupt us and eat us away on the inside. It's like saying, like, the idea of trying to hurt the person who has hurt you by withholding forgiveness, it's like holding your breath, hoping that they pass out. It'll take you a second to realize that, like, we think that we're bringing harm upon them, but we're actually bringing more harm upon ourselves. When we withhold forgiveness, we find that we have actually produced a self-inflicted wound in our lives. Or to put it another way, in our attempts to withhold forgiveness and hurt someone who has hurt us, we find that we we think we're building one prison cell, but we actually end up building two, and we find ourselves in one of them. You see what I'm saying? Like we, We tend to think that this idea of withholding forgiveness is going to hurt someone, but it ends up being a harm upon us. We imprison ourselves because we find ourselves uh, wrapped up in bitterness, like I mentioned, in resentfulness, but also in this idea of self-righteousness that says to the person who you're withholding forgiveness from, I would never do what they did to me. That is so often how unforgiveness works within our hearts, that we look at the person who has wronged us as if they are far worse than we are, and we tend to look at ourselves as way better than they are. Basically, the the unforgiving person is quick to see how heinous the person who has wronged us is and how quick to see how virtuous we are. We have a deluded understanding of ourselves and the wrongdoer. I I love how Croatian theologian Miroslav Volf puts it, which just saying his name makes you sound smart. But he says this, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinners. You see that? That's what unforgiveness does. We tend to look at the person who has wronged us as uniquely heinous and beneath us. And we tend to look at ourselves as uniquely virtuous as a person who would never do what they did to us. Now, as I say that, I I want you to make sure you're, you're not hearing what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the wrong that was committed against you is insignificant and you should just get over it already. I'm not saying that. The wrong that was done against you, the sin committed against you was legitimate. That it's real, that the pain is real. I'm not saying get over it. What I am saying is that I'm trying to guard all of us from the naive thinking that withholding forgiveness will make the situation better and will make you feel as though you have power over the person who has wronged you when in the end it does neither. In fact, it does more harm than we realize. Again, we set out to build one prison when we withhold forgiveness but we end up building two when we find ourselves in one of them. And I think Joseph knew this. I think he knew the power of both forgiveness and the pain of unforgiveness, which is evidenced as the story unfolds. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 45. So, so chapters 42 through 44, basically Joseph is testing his brothers. And it looks like he's kind of getting back at them, but as you really understand his heart, Joseph's trying to figure out who his brothers are. Have they changed at all in the last 22 years? Are they the same corrupt, malevolent punks who threw him in the pit? When we come to Genesis 45, verses 1 through 3, we read these words. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And then skipping down a bit in verse 2. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my brother still alive? Now notice, it's not Joseph's desire for revenge or payback that comes bursting out of him, but rather the thing that is kind of uncontrollable within him is his love for his brothers. 
It's his desire to be reconciled to them that he cannot hold within himself. It comes out with this uncontrollable force. I must share my love for my brothers. And in this moment, his brothers, are now, as, as they now realize who it is that's looking at them, they're standing before Joseph with this shock and incredulity of like, who, like what's going on here? Because they're shocked in two ways. One, the guy they're looking at, they presumed was dead. And two, the guy they're looking at, they probably think wants them dead. And he has the power to do it. In fact, that word that says his brothers were dismayed, the Hebrew word there, it's a word usually to describe the, the fear, the paralyzing fear that one experiences in times of war, where you are so overwhelmed and shell-shocked, if you will, by what's going on, you can't move forward. That's what his brothers are feeling. It's like discovering that the, the, the kid you bullied throughout middle school and high school is now your boss. And they have the power to kind of make your life miserable. And so you're surprised to see her there in this, in this job, but you're also surprised to see her in the position she holds, and you don't know what's going to come of this. But in a shocking turn of events, what Joseph does, what we would expect him to do, is to exact his judgment, to execute his brothers. But instead, he embraces them. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, we might think that he's, he's kind of like piling it on. Like, do you remember that time when you sold me into Egypt? You know, like, he's not trying to make them feel guilty. He's reminding them of their sin, but in the same breath, he comforts them. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. So not only does he draw them near and embrace them in love, but he comforts them and tries to make them not feel as bad for what they did. Which is just like, like he's basically saying like, hey guys, don't beat yourselves up for what you did. It's, it's okay, we'll work through this. Like he's caring for them as they are overwhelmed with shame and guilt in this moment. So rather, rather than placing more guilt upon their necks, which he, like all of us would, would not fault Joseph for doing, Rather than putting more, more guilt upon their necks, he kisses their necks, he hugs their necks, he embraces them in love. And, and we're forced to ask the question, how on earth is Joseph able to forgive his brothers? How is he able to love his family members who hoisted such a great evil and injustice upon him? And, and just as a side note, isn't, isn't that how it usually is? That the people who hurt us the most and the people who we hurt the most tend to share a common last name. We, we tend to hurt and be hurt by our own family. In some ways, it's easier to forgive a stranger or an enemy for that matter than it is to forgive a family member because the wounds feel so much more personal and intentional. And so as we look at Joseph, we might think that his forgiveness of his brothers is utterly foolish or impossible. And yet at the same time, we admire it and desire it for ourselves. And again, it's because forgiveness, it feels foolish, but it is always the right choice. It is always the right choice. Now, we, we've seen kind of what happens when we don't forgive. We've seen that in our attempts to hurt the person who has hurt us, in withholding forgiveness, we build two prisons and we find ourselves in one of them. But now I want us to turn our attention as we see Joseph's true heart towards his brothers, his desire to forgive them and be reconciled to them, I want us to now ask the question, what happens when we do forgive? What happens when we do forgive? When we see Joseph's outburst of emotion in the beginning of chapter 45, you almost get the sense that Joseph can't, can't like wait to forgive his brothers. It's like it's just been welling up and he's just been holding it in. Throughout this story, you've seen Joseph three times pause and step away and weep uncontrollably because of his desire and his love for his brothers. And finally, it comes out, this release of emotion that has been built up for 22 years. And he comes forth, and it's like he can't, can't wait to forgive these brothers who have wronged him and wished him dead. And so in this sense, what forgiveness is, how it functions in our life, it's not just something that righteous people should do out of obligation, but that forgiveness, while it is a gift we give to the person who has wronged us, it's a gift we end up giving ourselves. That it's, it functions like this pressure release valve. All this pressure is being built up and then you forgive this person and all of that resentment, all of that bitterness, all of this self-righteousness is released and let go of. 
And so just as withholding forgiveness is, is an act where you build two prisons, the act of forgiveness sets two prisoners free, and you find that you are one of them. That's the work of forgiveness in our lives. And, and I remember vividly experiencing this kind of phenomenon, the release of forgiveness in my own life. I was a freshman at K-State. It was the first semester. I had just come from a campus ministry meeting where I heard this incredible message on forgiveness. And I remember feeling this uncontrollable desire to finally forgive my father. And, and some of you know my, my, my story. I won't go into great detail, but my dad, when I was about the age of five, had an affair. He, he uh, left my mom and five kids. And so from the age of five to 19, I just harbored such resentment and bitterness towards my father and self-righteousness. I'll never be the kind of dad that he is. I mean, like, there was just so much. And some of it was, was unbeknownst to me. It was, it was this low-grade bitterness and resentment that kind of loomed beneath the surface. But I remember the moment as I realized I have to forgive this man. And I remember that proverbial weight just being released from my shoulders. And I, I know many of you have experienced that same phenomenon. And, and it led to this opportunity for me to, to ask forgiveness of my father for the way in which I, 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 I for, or the way I forgave him for what he had done to me. And what I realized is that yes, I gave my father a gift in forgiving him, but I also gave myself a gift in releasing myself of that kind of bitterness and resentment. And I believe that Joseph, he was fully aware of this kind of phenomenon, this kind of power that forgiveness produces. Joseph knew that this power of forgiveness would pave the way to the hope of reconciliation between himself and his brothers. But with that being said, let me, let me say something very importantly about those two words, about forgiveness and reconciliation. They're not synonyms. We tend to think that, that if you've forgiven someone and they have forgiven you, that, that, that therefore you are now reconciled, and that's not necessarily true. Forgiveness always works towards and hopes for reconciliation, which is the, the hope that the relationship is restored back to the way it once was. But forgiveness does not always produce and lead to or even require reconciliation at that moment. Let me explain what I mean. Forgiveness is when we sincerely and lovingly say to the person who has wronged us, you have sinned against me. Which is why Joseph said, like, I am Joseph, the brother who you sold into Egypt. Forgiveness says, you have sinned against me, but I promise to never hold that against you in whatever our relationship looks like moving forward. You have sinned against me, but I promise to never hold that against you in whatever our relationship looks like moving forward. It doesn't mean that you now hold on to it and you bring it back when these moments arise and you use this against the person who has wronged you. You promise to not hold this against them, but that doesn't mean that you can strike it from your memory. That's impossible. Contrary to what some people tend to say, forgiveness is not forgetting. We cannot strike that from our memories. Now, it doesn't mean that we still hold on to it, like I said, and bring it back in those moments of, hey, remember when you did this thing and you still hold it over them. Forgiveness truly releases it from that person. I will not count it against you. I, I love how theologian Lewis Smedes puts this. He says this, forgiving does not erase the bitter past. A healed memory is not a deleted memory. Instead, forgiving what we cannot forget creates a new way to remember. We change the memory of our past into a hope for our future. I think that is a beautiful way of understanding the, the relationship of forgiving and forgetting. We cannot forget the past, but forgiveness is not a masked way of saying, I'm still gonna hold on to this secretly and use it when you act up again. You remember that one time? Like, like no, forgiveness is releasing it. But hear me say this. Just because you have forgiven someone or just because you have been forgiven, it doesn't mean that the relationship is magically healed and that it's back to the way it once was. If you are, I mean, if, if someone, if an abused person can forgive their abuser, I mean, that, that can happen, absolutely. An abused person can forgive their abuser, and an abuser can ask for forgiveness, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship is now restored and is safe to return to for both parties. Whatever the relationship or situation is, it doesn't mean that that's never going to happen, but we must be careful to not equate forgiveness and reconciliation together. Forgiveness hopes for, it works towards reconciliation, but it's not always possible at that moment. 
And so for someone to forgive and completely give up all hope of reconciliation, that, that can be a really dangerous place, and we have to really check our hearts and where we are in this. Perhaps the reason why reconciliation is not possible in that moment is because the wounds are still too fresh, that you're in a place of deep woundedness. You may be able to forgive them for the wounds inflicted upon you, but the wounds are still too fresh. And so for you to return to that relationship as is right now, you're going to bring more harm upon yourself and possibly upon the person who has harmed you. It's also possible that reconciliation is not an option because the wrongdoer may still be unstable, unhealthy, unrepentant, and more likely to inflict harm upon themselves, upon you, upon others. In that moment, you're not doing the wrongdoer any favors by entering back into the space if there has not been real healing taking place. And I think, when you go back to the story of Joseph, this is what Joseph's doing. There's a reason why he spends all this time testing his brothers. He's not like, finally, it's not payback. He's not like, I'm finally in a place of power, like I'm gonna frame you for a crime. That's not what he's doing. He's trying to see, have my brothers changed at all? Or are they the same malevolent, corrupt men who threw me into a pit and sold me into slavery? I believe Joseph is testing the waters of the relationship that he hopes to return to. But he's trying to figure out, am I going to come back to these brothers and are they just going to throw me back in the pit? And I believe he sees that his brothers are genuine. The way in which Judah comes forward and says, I, I, will, I will volunteer as tribute. I will suffer the death of, uh, instead of Benjamin, I, put me in his place. And that's what compels Joseph to finally forgive his brothers and move forward in working towards reconciliation. Joseph forgave his brothers, but it doesn't mean that he's willing to let them throw him back into the pit. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between those things. And, and if, if, he would have, if, if Joseph would have discovered that his brothers had not changed, same corrupt people as they were, my guess is that Joseph probably, knowing who he is, would have forgiven them, but would not have returned to them in the same way. It would have looked like a very different relationship. So yes, forgiveness hopes for, works towards reconciliation, but forgiveness doesn't require that you put yourself back into a toxic, abusive, oppressive relationship or situation that is going to only enable the person who has committed the wrong against you and place yourself in harm's way. And now admittedly, hear me, this is hard to discern. The decision of saying, is this relationship, is this situation, this job, this place, this home, whatever it is, is this a safe place to return? That is a question that you should not answer by yourself. It is a question that requires reliance upon the Holy Spirit. It requires wisdom of scripture. It requires the guidance and the counsel of trusted friends and leaders who love Jesus, who understand grace and forgiveness and want to walk with you and the person who has harmed you as you move forward. And I know, I know that there are some of us this morning who, again, this is not theory. This is not just theology. This is real. Today, you're in the midst of being in an abused relationship. You're, you're maligned at work. You're bullied at school. You're rejected by family. And there are some of us who are guilty of those things. And so some of us this morning, we need, we need to ask for forgiveness. And there are some of us who need to forgive but regardless, I think all of us are asking, we, we now know what it means, what happens when we don't forgive. We see what happens when we do forgive, but I think we're still wondering, asking the question, what does it take to forgive? What does it now take to forgive? And, and let, me, let me end with just a few things for us to consider here. As we seek to be a people who, who gather here and celebrate the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus, and as we are sent out to be a forgiving people in the places God calls us, what does it take to forgive? And the first thing I would say is this, we need to see the greatness of God, which sounds super churchy and really hollow, but let me explain what I mean. Joseph was able to embrace his brothers instead of execute them. He was able to forgive them and pursue reconciliation precisely because he knew that God was sovereign over this whole story and was using and orchestrating all of the details, even the evil intentions of his brothers he was using them for greater good, for himself, for Egypt, and for the surrounding nations. And Joseph makes this clear that God is the one who is sovereignly orchestrating all these details. Look at me at 45 verses five through eight. Three times Joseph says this, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse seven, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. Verse eight, so it was not you, his brothers, who sent me here, but God. 
In many ways, it is Joseph's faith in the providence of God, which is a fancy theological word for God's sovereign reign over all things and his intimate involvement in the details of every part of our lives. Joseph's faith in the providence of God is what enabled him to look at his brothers and say, even though you intended evil for me, I believe God is working out all these things for my good, and I've begun to see it. And so I would say that a small view of God diminishes our chance, our ability, and our desire to forgive those who have wronged us. But a large view of God, a grand view of who God is and how he is at work and all the details of life, that is what prepares us and equips us to be a forgiving people. So here's what I would say, and I I wanna say this sensitively. If you find yourself struggling to forgive those who have wronged you legitimately, they've wronged you legitimately, if you find yourself struggling to forgive, it's possible that it's not because the sin was so great against you, but it's possible because your view of God is not great enough. Again, I say that to not make light of your experience or the pain and hurt that you have gone through, but is it possible that our unwillingness to forgive comes from a very small view of God? So second, we also need to trust in the justice of God, which is related to this, but let me, let me explain what I mean. When we fail to trust that God will right all wrongs, then we feel like we can't forgive those who have hurt us because they're just gonna get away with it. If there, if, if, here, follow me here. If there is no divine judge sitting on the bench of the courtroom of the universe, then there is no, there's no confidence or hope that the wrongs committed against us, or anyone for that matter, will be righted. And so we will either find ourselves going down the path of despair, like, well, what's the point? They're gonna get away with it, get off the hook, or we'll go down the path of vengeance saying, somebody's gotta do something about this. It might as well be me. If there is no God of justice, if God won't punish evil, then someone has to. And so when we have a diminished and truncated understanding of the justice of God, it will result in us either allowing violence or vengeance to take over our lives and enter into our world. But when we trust that that God is just, then we can forgive those who wrong us because we trust that the judge of all the earth will do what is right. We need to see the greatness of God. We need to trust in the justice of God. But lastly, and I think maybe most importantly, if we want to know how to forgive, we have to rest in the forgiveness of God. The best way to know how to forgive is to know how forgiven you are. I I mean, if if there's anything you remember from this morning, may it be that, that if we want to know how to forgive, the best way to know how to forgive is to know how forgiven you are. The reason you and I struggle to be a forgiving people is because we struggle to believe and rest in and delight in the fact that we are a forgiven people. The reason we struggle to be a forgiving people is because we struggle to believe we are a forgiven people. And I would say, of, of all of the encounters that Jesus has in the New Testament, my, my favorite by far is in Luke chapter seven. In Luke seven, Jesus is encountered by this woman who's simply referred to as a sinful woman. More than likely, she's a prostitute. And she comes to the home where Jesus is dining with these religious leaders. And she begins to wash Jesus' feet. And the religious leaders are grumbling and complaining and saying, how could Jesus allow this woman to defile her? And then Jesus confronts them. And with this beautiful, powerful flipping of the script, He tells them this parable and concludes with these words in Luke chapter seven. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many. So notice, Jesus doesn't doesn't make light of, he doesn't mitigate or diminish, like it's not that big of a deal. No, like her sins, which are many. He's not downplaying her sin. Jesus doesn't deal with her sin by just sweeping under the rug. He says, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Friends, this is, th- there is a direct correlation between the depth of our understanding of how forgiven we are by God through Christ Jesus and our ability and willingness and desire to forgive those who have sinned against us. The power to forgive comes from the power of being forgiven. And if we get to this place where we claim that, no, 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 the sins that have been committed, you, you don't know my story, Reed. You don't know the evils done against me. And you're right, I don't. But I also know that the sins committed against you, the sins committed against me, do not compare to our sins against a holy and righteous God. And when we understand the holiness of God, 
And the way in which he has forgiven us of our sins, that and that alone is what empowers us to be the kind of forgiving people we long to be. But if we get to the point of saying, no, the sins committed against me are so egregious I cannot forgive them, what you are saying in that moment is that you think very little of God's forgiveness towards you, you think very highly of the sins of others, and you think very, very lowly of your own sins. In that moment also what you're saying is that this sin is unforgivable, which is the equivalent of saying I am God. That's kind of what we're saying. And again, I don't want want to make light of the sins committed against us. But friends, when we understand the depth of God's forgiveness towards us, when we know what he has accomplished for us in Christ and the cost that that he endured for us, we will never be able to look at a sin committed against us and say it's so egregious that it cannot be forgiven. Because at the heart of the gospel, Miroslav Volf says this so beautifully again. He says, at the sight of our sin, God did not give way to uncontrolled rage. Instead, God bore our sin and condemned it in Jesus Christ. That's how we should treat those who transgress against us. We should absorb the wrongdoing in order to transform the wrongdoers. That is the heart of the gospel. We have been forgiven so that we might be transformed and through the grace of Jesus Christ extend the ministry of forgiveness and reconciliation to those around us. Friends, if you want to be a forgiving person, then you need to be a forgiven person. That's what we need. And so my my plea to you is that if you find yourself struggling to forgive someone, is it possible that you have not come to trust, rest, and delight, and bring yourself back to every single day the reality that you are a sinner in need of grace, but you have been forgiven by God through Christ Jesus, who suffered on your behalf, paid your debt in full, and so that you have not to bear this sin ever again? Do you want to be a forgiving person? Then be a forgiven person, trusting in the one who has made this possible for you. You see, forgiveness feels foolish, but it is always the right choice, and thanks be to God that Jesus, so to speak, made the right choice in extending forgiveness to us that we might be forgiven and empowered to be forgivers. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, would you forgive us of of failing to understand the depth of your forgiveness towards us? Lord, would you show us how holy and how perfect you are, how sovereign you are over all things, Lord, and may that compel us to be a people who are able to trust that in your greatness, in your justice, in your mercy, as you have forgiven us, Lord, we can forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, I pray for those in this room who are wounded by the sins of others, who feel as though they can't forgive. Lord, would you be the God of comfort? Would you, remi- would you remind them tenderly of your love towards them, of your forgiveness towards them, and would that free them from the prisons of, of resentment and bitterness? And Lord, for those of us who need to be forgiven, Lord, would we not allow ourselves to fall under shame and guilt so much that we do not see your ability to forgive us? Lord, may our sins not keep us from your grace because we cannot out your ability to forgive us. And so, Lord, would you accomplish this work in our lives? Free us, free those for the first time, perhaps, who are enslaved to sin, and may you bring them into new life through Christ Jesus. We pray that you would do this, Lord, for our good and for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.